leave the lights up. Remember, that's the experiment this time. We've been doing, by the way, in case everyone doesn't know, um, since about June, I've been recording the all the presentations, not just my own here, and putting them up on a YouTube playlist. And it's starting to grow to a link that you could spend hours watching your favorite ATL rug talks all over again. But one of the things is getting video right is actually very difficult. Uh, and so even the lighting um, has has been problematic. So like last time, um, I started experimenting with this lamp to try, because whoever's standing here disappears into the dark whenever that comes up, and then kind of overdid it, and poor um, Calvin had like like shadow puppets going on. So, And I think he felt like he was being interrogated by the police. So try not to do that setup again. By the way, his talk was awesome, as I remember the password. Exactly. And there's a bit.ly link, and we're trying to figure out because YouTube li uh, URLs are really obnoxious, but um, it works. So. We're... Oh, yes, that's good. To the degree that I get the links, I put them on. So send them to me or to someone, to someone and they'll follow it. Very cool. Well, so you have this fancy remote. I love these things. Okay, let's see. So, we actually did, so we're doing a talk on remote pair programming, and we actually remote pair program the remote pair programming talk. And the way, we'll get into that a little bit, but the way we did that was actually with Google, uh, Google Drive. Uh, that was the first time I spent serious time in their presentation tool, and it's actually pretty good. So I went ahead and exported it to run locally just because I don't want to mess with the internet here. So anyway, hi everybody. My name is Frank Rietta, and as some of you may know, I've had my own Rails development company for the last several years and working with various clients, most of whom are startups and basically doing full-time Ruby development and having a lot of fun doing it. And this is Brandon Dees. I'm Brandon Dees. Um, I uh, quit playing rock and roll music and settled down to a web development job working with Frank recently. Uh, we've been pair programming remotely uh, for about the past year. I live in Nashville, oh, yeah, Tennessee, in Atlanta, so. and uh, work with him from Atlanta. We do a lot of our uh, collaboration with our clients remotely as well. Um, so, you know, we thought we could pull from some of that experience and sort of have a bit of an open discussion about those topics. Um, we hope you will all contribute into this conversation. Sure. Um, feel free to you know raise your hand and interrupt or whatever if you have anything to add in. Uh, we're going to talk a lot about the tools we use and that kind of thing. And uh, so okay. I'll let Frank take it away. Yeah, so I'm going to start out with a quote of biblical proportions because Solomon was a pair programming fan. Iron sharpens iron and one man sharpens another. So um, I thought it was kind of cool. And, Brian, you want to drive for a bit? Sure. Yeah, that's one of the uh, important fundamentals of being a, a considerate pair of programmers. You know, cooperate and be polite to each other, courteous. Don't just, like, steal the keyboard. Um, so, ultimately, po pair programming is about teamwork. Uh, it's about, you know, working together towards the same goal. It requires a lot of uh, open communication. Uh, it requires mutual respect. You have to be polite and considerate. You can't just, like, leave your partner hanging blowing in the wind while you're in the middle of a pairing session because you end up just wasting double the waste loss productivity there. Um, there are a lot of reasons to do pair programming if you don't already. Um, you know, you increase the level of accountability and focus and intensity in a session, sort of, you know, the peer pressure factor sort of like hones you in on paying attention, being on your game. Um, there's, you know, shared knowledge, uh, combined mental energies towards solving a problem. Um, you have sort of a built-in code review process because you catch more defects as you create them. Um, and, you know, there are social benefits as well. Um, there are some gotchas, however. Uh, they're not too serious. We don't think they're worth um, not pair programming over. Um, you know, scheduling problems, technical difficulties, connectivity problems are the big one. Um, 
And it's not quite the same as sharing a physical workspace. There are you know, little things like having hallway conversations, hanging around the water cooler, getting a cup of coffee together, things like that that alter the group dynamics of a team working together that you can't really fully duplicate remotely, although you can come pretty close yeah. depending on uh, how your setup is. You mind if I drive for a bit? Yeah. Thanks. Okay, so um, I wanted to touch on uh, some of this too. So the first one up there, the scheduling difficulties. So if you're all co-located in the same place, you can be like, knock, knock, remember we have the stand-up meeting? Whereas I actually now need to actually put it on the Google Calendar, make sure everyone who's going to be in the meeting gets it. You know, Brandon didn't just decide because he hadn't heard anything, they can go change the oil in his car. You know, all these sorts of things. I um, did, yeah. yeah, I did, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> that or sometimes the, uh, oh yeah, I had to actually get up. <laughs> that, that, that usually happens to me. Like, um, I had a, a client call at like 8.30 a.m. all worried because the 8 a.m. Uh, meeting didn't happen. I'm like, oh, junk. Okay. Um, so, the, so anyway, the software issues, so we're both on Macs now, so that's not really not been a major problem. Um, before that, Brandon was all Linux all the time, and I was on a Mac. So we had to find something other than, say, FaceTime for the telepresence component, which we can talk about a little bit later. Um, and then the CPU bound issues when your GPU is not actually supported by your Linux kernel is a very real thing on you know real time video. Um, oh, and one last thing. So some of these reasons about this hallway stuff, in startup land culture, often being co-located is sometimes obnoxiously prioritized as like a vitally important thing. We don't believe it actually is. There are companies like GitHub that prove it really isn't, but there's still that predominant culture. And it's great, but you know, if you insist on all being in the same place, a couple of things happen economically for a software company. One. You either have to convince everyone to move or you have to recruit locally. And if you're in a market like Atlanta that's hypersaturated, you're really limited your ability to you know, find good people. Um, so I think the benefits of having your workflow support this it out, per, outweighs the cons of not being able to have your cool midtown office with everyone in it. Um, anyway. <laughs> so, okay. Pair programming, the Kent Beck way, or um, by the way, who knows who, when I say Kent Beck, who I'm talking about? Okay, so back in 99, he wrote a book on extreme programming, which is a, a body of practices, one of, of which is pair programming, and he's not the only one who's written about it, but that, that's where this came from. So two, pro, two programmers, one computer. Um, if you did anyone ever compete in the ACM intercollegiate programming competitions in college? Crickets. I did. Uno. Uh, okay. <laughs> Yay! Uh, yeah, we would alternate between Georgia Tech and UCF winning. But the thing that's interesting about that is it was actually one computer, three programmers. So uh, you, that that was more that was different. Anyway. Um, <laughs> Comfy chairs are pretty important. Um, personally, I have never found a startup office that had chairs that I liked. Uh, so I kind of have a much nicer chair that I've invested in on my own at my own house and is so much nicer. So uh, that's a benefit of remote pair programming. Um, typically, one suggestion like these gentlemen are doing is that you have a single keyboard and mouse so you can point when you're navigating and the driver can do his thing. Um, I'm actually a Dvorak typist now, so if I did this, uh, I would probably need a second keyboard that's set to Dvorak, uh, unless my pair programming partner also had a love for alternate keyboard layouts. Um, switching roles, so we've used the term driver and navigator. Uh, you uh, switch roles, uh, and someone's driving is doing the typing, and someone's navigating is, you know, thinking about the problem, talking through. Um, you know what's going on. If you're ping pong pair programming, so one might write the test and one might write the implementation, but you're collaborating the whole time and you switch. Uh, so it's not about you know one person monopolizing the keyboard all day. Um, good etiquette. Do you mind if I drive for a bit? Um, and then focus. It really, if I'm pairing with someone, I can't be like, oh, let me check my Facebook. 
oh, I wonder what's going on in Hacker News. I actually got to pay attention to. I still do that sometimes, but I got to really pay attention to. <laughs> Productivity <laughs> really noticeably goes down the tubes as soon as that starts to happen. It's like very detectable on both sides of the table if one or the other of us is like really not paying attention anymore. So exactly. it's important to like actually zero in and you know even if it means having condensed sessions, uh, just always you know sort of team up and gear in on the problem. Exactly. And hey, you want to try? Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, so. We've just talked about the sort of prescribed methodology for pair programming, which was also oriented towards in-person. Yes? How, I mean, you guys have been pairing for a while. How often do you guys break? Because I know when I pair that after a while, I'm like, dude, I, I need to play something. I think that's yeah. just up to the participants. It's sort of, what we, we sort of do what's comfortable for us. Like, you know, if somebody needs to go pee or whatever, we should say, hey, I got to go pee. Just let me go. And, and that's it. Just, you know. Um, and, really you know, and usually both of us get up at the same time and go take a couple minutes to stretch or whatever and then come back and get back to it. And yeah. it's sort of like the uh, Pomodoro method, you know. And sometimes um, it's the dog that has to go. Like, yeah, you know. The there's always distractions working from home. Um, but yeah, we recommend uh, do what works for you. Don't just like adhere to some prescribed philosophy of pair programming, TDD, you know, the whole uh, regimen just because you're supposed to like do something that works. It's all about communication, working together, um, and uh, so the point of it is to optimize the flow of communication within a dev team so that you sort of improve the total net communication level, and this increases the quality of code and all that. Because programming is about communication in the first place. Um, if that's you know communicating uh, project requirements, specs dealing with clients, um, communicating with your past and future selves or other programmers. Um, Who wrote this code? It's horrible. Yeah, I mean, code, has, <laughs> code is a form of communication itself. And so above all else, you know, you should be optimizing for the communication benefits of whatever workflow you're using. So, you know, experiment if you have to. Our daily routine consists of usually starting out with, we call it a, a, a stand-up meeting, but it's not necessarily formal like that. Um, but we do schedule a time of day to meet and to, you know, be at the desk ready to work. Um, we uh, can sort of simulate a standard uh, stand-up meeting and, you know, review priorities and, and blocking and all that uh, in the same format just by using the telepresence tools. Um, so it's not really a limitation. Um, we usually go ahead, like, before we sit down, we knock out all the distractions, uh, coffee refills, bathroom breaks, stretching get all of our news feed reading for the morning uh, done so we don't have anything on our minds other than just getting some work done. Um, you know, we usually review some priorities and pick some tasks and then either zero in together on solving a specific problem and we do the ping pong thing, uh, driver navigator, or sometimes we just leave the telepresence running like we're in a shared space and, you know, we work on separate stories sometimes. Um, again, this is just, you know, we're flexible to do whatever we need to that works for us. Right. You and it often depends, sure. Um, and, and some of that depends on, like, let's say we had been planning. I can't tell you how many times this has happened. Uh, we've been planning to get something done um, as a pair session, but I'll get a panicked email from a client, like, their robots, the text is not working, like something ridiculous. And so I will often have to focus on that while Brandon works on his, like, what we had planned to work on together or vice versa. So, I mean, you still got to get everything done. Um, I think in larger companies, they have more people to throw up problems. In little companies like ours, get to wear many hats. Okay, the three major components of remote, our remote workflow. Uh, the first is the telepresence, which is a term that we're using to refer to the just real-time chat. Um, it could be FaceTime, it could be a peer.in, there's a whole variety of these things. Uh, collaborative editing. So for this presentation, we use Google Docs. Uh, for code, oh, I mean, we've done everything from just like screen sharing where you can't control the cursor, you know, using, it's like, hey, you're driving. So, and then when he's done driving, he'll commit his changes, I'll get the update, and then I'm driving. Uh, we've done that. Uh, we've also experimented with various tools. Uh, Tmux is awesome if you like Vim or, or Emacs in the command line. Um, uh, we're experimenting with a new tool called, is it Screen Hero? Yeah, Screen Hero. Okay, Screen Hero, just this week, 
learned about it from Joe Moore's um, awesome blog on remote pair programming. That's at remotepairprogramming.com. Uh, it's very much worth checking out. And Joe works for Pivotal Labs, so he's the type of guy who remote pairs eight hours a day, every day, because they are pretty intense about their pair programming um, in that company. And then file sharing, so Dropbox, that sort of thing. Oh, I guess I'm actually telling you about the next slide. Oops. Okay, so, <laughs> um, so I, you take over, please. Okay. <laughs> Um, we've covered some of these tools already. Um, feel free to chime in with your own if you have anything you recommend. Um, what we've been using lately is FaceTime, Mac to Mac. It's really easy to just you know ring up the other person on FaceTime. It's a pretty seamless video chat experience, and uh, we do um, usually you know a, a shared SSH session um, to do the coding component of that. Um, Google Plus Hangout is great for telepresence. It's very cross-platform. You can use it on a tablet or whatever. Uh, it supports up to 10 people uh, all at once. Um, so we use it a lot for clients. Um, and uh, it's got built-in screen sharing, so it makes that whole component easier. Um, and you know, in an emergency, if there's a connectivity problem, bandwidth problem, uh, we fall back sometimes to XMPP, you know, just Jabber uh, chat client or whatever. We have had uh, you know temporary team members who, you know, for whatever reason, it's not you know okay for them to run a video feed of their uh, bedroom or whatever. And you know, we just handle communicating with them in real time in a chat room as if we're all just hanging out. Um, and uh, for collaboration, we use things like uh, the Google Drive tools. They're all you know, you can have multiple cursors, multiple people interacting, editing on the same document at the same time. Um, screen, screen Hero we mentioned, it's kind of like VNC or RDP on steroids. Um, you get multiple cursors and all that, but it's a shared screen experience. And um, uh, the great uh, classic setup for the uh, terminal junkies is the SSH plus TMUXer screen. Um, we use a tool called Biobu, which is sort of a kickstarted configuration with keyboard shortcuts and tabs and some handy stuff that makes that easier to use. Do you mind if I drive for a yeah. second? Oh, thanks. Okay, so um, about this actually, uh, we've been talking about Google Drive, and you're like, what does that have to do with coding? Requirements gathering, like writing you know, up responses to clients about like why their design will not. There's a lot of stuff that goes into development other than just cranking out code. Yeah, mock-ups. Um, so, and once you get to actual Ruby code, you're pretty much using a standard editor, not Google Drive. In case that wasn't clear, I thought I would point that out. And, okay. So about the file sharing tools. So everyone here, pretty, who knows about Dropbox? Yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, it's I use it too. Um, there's some others uh, that are like it. Some give you more space. But since it involves like syncing data up to a cloud server that you don't control, and there's sometimes maybe we've had clients that have dealt with data that they really don't want on some server, whatever. So what you end up doing in that case, we've been using something called BitTorrent Sync, which is by uh, the BitTorrent company. That's this really well-funded startup out in California. And so it's a, it's a secure peer-to-peer -peer file syncing mechanism. And one of the things that we do that I didn't originally plan to mention is that we, it does one-way sync. So I have, a, I have an actual uploads folder where, and there's under that two Brandon Ds and then in my downloads folder, there's a from Brandon D's. So we have bi-directional one-way file syncs where we can drop in a file, even a GPG encrypted file, um, to the other recipient. So if I need to send them a four gigabyte uh, you know, disk image and I don't want to eat up just tons of Dropbox space, uh, that has worked really well. And so now we can talk about the gear. So a couple of things I want to say about gear is in a few minutes we're going to show you photos of our setups. Um, or at least my setup. You didn't get photos this yeah, time. I was on the photos, okay. Oh well. Um, you don't need what we have in order to do this. Um, we're doing some other things like doing screencasting or and getting geared up for it. So some of our gear is on the higher end of what's actually necessary. So just wanted to talk about some of the minimum uh, cost to entry. If you have a decent computer like a MacBook, you're set. Um, it the camera's fine. You have to have a good internet connection, minimally. Like, that's really the biggest thing. Um, you really probably need a headset. Uh, trying to do it without. Uh, the, the microphone in the MacBook tends to pick up fan noise and also pick up room echo. 
and if you are an audiophile like Brandon, he can hear that instantaneously and it's distracting. So having reducing the uh, the, the echo is pretty important. Most, but, most of this equipment is all about making the experience comfortable to do, you know, for a long session day after day, as opposed to just being able to get it done at all. So we'll have there's sort of a minimum set of gear that you really absolutely have to to have as baseline, and it's really super cheap. So there's no excuse not to try doing pairing, uh, even if you have to be remote. Um, and then you know we'll have our sort of recommendations for the gear that we use. So any questions so far? Does anybody else here do remote pairing? Sure. Interesting. And actually, we've, I mean, Screen Hero does the remote control mice. We've done so much without it because we've been doing from Linux to Mac where there really wasn't a good option. I don't really see that as a true requirement, like at least with our workflow. Unless, unless, unless maybe you have like a GUI IDE that you depend on, um, such as for iOS. But even then, if he's driving and we, I can't control his mouse and I can see his screen, we can still talk about it. And then when I need to drive, he just has to commit to Git, and I got to pull from Git, and then we're back going. It's it's not an unstoppable problem, um, you know, to to not have that remote control capability. Oh yeah, someone else mentioned um, Nitrous IO, which is sort of a um, a shared uh, cloud workspace on you know just a, a VPS that you have limited access to that has like a built-in web IDE with some chat features and stuff. Uh, I've been watching that product for a while. Um, I think it just recently. Uh, achieve some of the minimum requirements that we have to be able to use it, like we need Postgres um, and some things like that. So we will plan on giving that a try and uh, maybe we'll report in. Sure. And we can go to the next one. I think I covered this already. Yeah. So, oh yeah, the, uh, the room echo issue. So what has worked really well for us has been uh, blue microphones. So I have a blue snowball condenser microphone. He has a blue Yeti. And those sound really good. And they don't need a fancy audio interface to plug your XLR cable into your computer. So uh, it works pretty well. Um, so, and we've had questions. So this is my setup. And the gear, wow, that's really washed out. So the gear that I want to talk about, total, I totaled it up, it was about $300. And this is a lot more than, and that's not counting the computer and the keyboard and all the normal stuff. That's this microphone uh, there, the stand for the microphone, which we can get into, and the lighting. the lighting. So I have a track light, high quality track lighting above my head and behind it. Because when you're doing video, especially if you're going to be, in this case, recording screencasts, it's all about the lighting. Otherwise, you're in the dark and it's grainy. So, um, and also uh, presenting to clients, which we do uh, right. most of our client communications over video. Well. Yeah, so I'm actually not counting the redecorating that I did to stage the entire area behind my desk is completely designed around the webcam, like where the bookshelves are. Where it's, it's again, this isn't to pair with Brandon. It, it's sort this of to conceal the, the fact that he's working from his bedroom and to make it to be able to create the uh, the impression that you know he's in an office. It's legit. Right. Um, well, it is a legit office that happens to be in my house. It's true. <laughs> so um, that's more because we work with clients from all sorts of different size companies. So um, anyway, so the snowball is, here's a close-up of it. I have it mounted at the end of a on-stage mic stand. And the reason I did that is it, can't, it comes with this little bitty stand that picks up every vibration coming through the desk. So the external hard drive doing it rumbling, the fan on the computer doing it spinning, uh, all these things pick up noise. Uh, so I did several things to do noise abatement. So if you notice up there those external drives, by the way, that's my three terabyte media drive that helps me actually do these videos for us. 
Um, I have the insulation that came with a MacBook Air box to isolate the drives so that they don't vibrate each other or vibrate the desk. Um, under the computer, which you can't see, it's on a stand. I have another foam layer I scavenged from another box, and that's to isolate any vibration coming from the Mac from transmitting to the desk. And then the mic stand itself is standing on the floor. So it is also isolated. So between all these things, uh, the microphone tends to get a very good uh, solid audio signal. If you go back here, you'll notice this is my standard where remote pairing session, and the mic's up here over my head. So what's happening is when I look up, because you have to look at the camera in order to look in your remote pair's eyes if, instead of like looking down, um, it picks up well. If I'm recording a screencast, you'll notice the pop filter. That's not strictly necessary for this setup because it's enough distance, but if I'm recording a screencast and doing a voiceover for that, I'll bring the microphone up closer. And when you're up close like this, you have this really full sound into the microphone, and you need the pop filter to uh, reduce uh, the noise. And a pop filter, by the way, is basically just, you know, pantyhose wrapped around a circle frame. Um, so, like, you can get them really cheap, you can make your own, but uh, when you're up and up close to the mic, if you do P's and T's, it makes like sort of a popping sound in the mic that you know peaks the the gain out, and it just sounds bad if you're like recording it or anything. So that just corrects for that. I mean, there's a lot of squishy structural material in your body. If you had just a, a headset mic, would be isolated from. Yeah, the headsets headset. work great. So uh, they're a good option. Use a headset mic? Uh, we sort of upgraded to studio grade mics just so that we can do recording and uh, other types of. Is it I mean, is it, is it really purely quality or you just don't want it showing in the video? Or? Part of, it's mostly just audio quality difference. So a headset has a very distinct sound, which is fine if you are Skyping because everyone expects it to sound like a phone call. But if you're recording a voiceover for like a promotional video for your, your company, um, that sound quality doesn't sound like the sound quality of the professional videos. So. Um, it's okay not to be an expert, but you have to get into the ballpark of the thing. Or it's like, what, what's going on with these guys? They, they're on a shoestring budget. So, so that's more of the reason for this. And, Most and, you know, of this our is setup is to eliminate uh, factors that decrease, noticeably degrade the appearance of total professionalism. Because we do work with a wide variety of different clients at different levels. So, yeah, and that's it. So this is not strictly necessary for. Just getting started. No, not, definitely not necessary just for pairing. No. Um, the track lighting, this is also not strictly necessary. So this is directly over my head. Um, and these are all 60 watt equivalent, 900 lumen uh, dimmable LED bulbs, daylight spectrum. And these two point to the wall to get the ambient light reflection. This one is set to illuminate my head from above so when you're sitting in front. So this causes me not to be in a shadow. Um, when picked up by this webcam. Um, I have a, a similar track behind me all the way at the other end of the room on the whiteboard that illuminates that side of the room for functionality and it also the whiteboard is intentionally positioned so that, that that acts as a big umbrella reflector coming back at... So this is what I'm saying that we've engineered the studio setup for this. Um, that's, that's and a lot, of, a lot of that is just purely for presentational value since, since we are addressing clients by this, by this means as well. Exactly. Um, Not necessary in the least. Yes, sir. As someone who's married, I'm assuming you're not in your bedroom. <laughs> it's in my office. He, he was joking about the, the bedroom portion. <laughs> okay. Good. Okay. I have, I have this thing called a bonus room that I can do anything I want. <laughs> so, um, we won't talk about the air conditioning for the summer, but <laughs> okay. Um, and that's about that. So, Brandon, would you yeah. like to drive? I've got a little bit of money invested in my setup as well. Um, sorry, I forgot to take photos on my desk setup. Here's what I'm using. I've got the Blue Yeti. It's a it's a very versatile studio grade USB mic. Um, just plug it in. It's got a great built-in uh, digital analog converter and. Uh, three and a half millimeter output so you can plug headphones directly into it. Um, it also needs uh, insulation from uh, the vibrations through the desk, so I put it on a, a scissor arm like this, which is mounted to my desk, makes it really easy to just pull the mic right to me, push it out of my way when I don't want to use it. Um, and uh, that's uh, about 25 bucks. 
Uh, I've also got a cheap pop filter. Not really necessary. We've already talked about that. This is uh, what I switch to instead of earbuds when my ears get uncomfortable. A, uh, just a Cirque Morrow headset. Anyone will do as long as you are happy with it. Um, this is one that I personally recommend and have been using. Um, it's got you know simulated surround sound and subwoofers and all that stuff for like gaming and movies. Uh, it's got really good sound for the price, and uh, you know there's some technical rough edges with like the USB interface and stuff, but all around very good value. Um, and I say this as a musician. Um, but if you really want to start doing remote pairing with just bare bones gear, you can get in the game for you know less than 50 bucks if, all, if you know, you have the most minimal bare bones laptop and uh, it needs all this stuff. So you know, just a cheap USB headset for about 10 bucks, uh, USB sound card, another five, ten, ten bucks. Um, you can get a cheap, cheap, like uh, security webcam for like under 10 bucks, um, and that just gives you the ability to do all of the remote telepresence stuff that you need to sort of simulate being in the same room with someone who's you know anywhere. Um, uh, anybody have any questions? I might have missed this, but how do you convince your clients that pair programming is like way better than not? We just tell them we do it, and they can take it or leave it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's a nice broad question. Who else does pairing? Have you had that discussion? Um, we've um, we actually work. The company I work for was a client of Pivotal Labs, mm -hmm. so we would pair with pivots and pair amongst ourselves. That's how I came to pair with uh, Joe Moore. Okay. Um, and for us, it was really simple. I mean, we just saw uh, how these guys were able to um, solve problems and just get things done. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> that that was all our CEO needed at the time. Okay. And for us also, Patrick, I'll go as far as to say, just from a business point of view, and we can kind of talk about the mathematics of it later, we structure the way our company bills in such a way that if a, cu a customer's like, no, you may not pair, you must do this, it won't save them a dime. Like, literally, the way we bill for developer time assumes a pair um, and is not. So there's, there's no discount for a single developer working solo <coughs> if that's what has to happen. But. Um, it also has no penalty for adding a developer. Yeah. So it, it tends to work out pretty well. Anything else? Anybody got any like tools or equipment to recommend? You guys already mentioned yours. Go. So yeah, so with the team lock setup, do you tend to just pick someone's machine and stay in that machine for the whole session? Yeah. Maybe Normally we'll just SSH into mine and you know I'll run the session. I, I tend to be a little bit snappier with the keyboard shortcuts with the over, so I'll manage the tabs and stuff and he'll like you know help with editing and um, you know, we do the, the driver navigator thing, so we switch off, I'll be typing, he'll say, you know. Yeah. Let me if it's something. SQL, he yeah. usually wants me to be driving. Yeah, he's, he's more of a database expert, so I'll let him do most of that stuff and just sort of watch him learn. Um, I, I can't remember the name of it. I think it's from the same guys that did meetings.io or something. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a new product that it's like it, it's like for remote teams where the person's just kind of, their, it takes a picture of their face like every yeah. 10 seconds or something oh, yeah. and like shows it on the screen. So I work with people that live in like Philadelphia. So, yeah, it's like a low bandwidth Snapchat. Right? Yeah, but then, but then you can like upgrade to the, like a regular like real-time video chat. Too. Yeah. So it's ah, a really nice. cool tool for So like it's not quite like slow office, scan so. from the moon? It's a little bit faster? <laughs> well, okay. Yeah, a little bit. Anything? Do you guys spend most of your time pairing or all of your time? I would say we spend most of our working time in telepresence, if not strictly pairing. And you, you're the only two working together, you don't have other people on your team? Uh, we have a little bit, we have a few other people that rotate in and out on projects, but yeah, we're, we're pretty much the company right now. How many hours a day are you actually pairing? Depends on the day. <laughs> 16, I think, is our record. Uh, it, no, it was bad. <laughs> Um, oh, 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 okay. Typical, typical we, afternoon, we, five, we, five hours or so. It's yeah. hard for me to do a full eight hours because I'm always dealing with client stuff. He's also like, running the business on his own um, from you know, a business management standpoint, and I'm kind of just showing up to do the coding stuff. So, um. Yes. Um, my working experience with um, Pivotal 
Um, we pair every day from after stand up from nine thirty to like quarter to six, mm -hmm. um, and that's constant. And I'll tell you, as someone who never paired prior to that experience, it was the first three months were pretty brutal mm -hmm. because I'm used to having my own way right. and um, yeah, not being takes. able to like just bully, bully or just you know get my way all the time was pretty tough. Yeah. But after a while, you know, you, you buy into it, you yeah. know. Yeah. What, can you share an example? Like, what does it mean to get your way that you had to then, like, go up and cooperate? Well, I mean, sometimes you have to let people make mistakes. Okay. Or you have to actually see where they're going, you know, because yeah. there are times when you're pairing with someone and they have an idea as to how to solve the problem, but they might not be very good at communicating how they're mm. going to solve it. And you're like, we've done it this way forever. It's like, there's a, there's a standard solution. You, you have to sort of like retrain your ego to be a little gentler. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it, it does foster much stronger communication amongst the team. And a lot of patience. Have you ever had something that you wanted to do that your pair partner disagreed with and you had to like sell them on it? Um, you... Actually, I, I, I'm a very passive pair. Okay. Um, as a result of this, just due to my size, um, um, so, so as a result of the, of my size, I I tend to let people you know go as far as they want okay. up until a certain point, you know. So it might be fifteen, twenty, thirty minutes of them coding and mm -hmm. you know writing tests and you know writing code to support the test or vice versa or trying to figure out how to solve the problem. After a while, you know, you know. Right. Now, are you pairing co-located or are you doing remote pairing? Co-located. Okay. Co-located. Okay. And, and I've done remote pairing as well. Since you've done both, um, what would you say, because I've never actually been in a work environment where I did co-located pair programming. So this remote pair programming has been my professional experience. How would you say the difference is? Um, the biggest problem with remote pairing on a, on a big team is um, you hope that the person you're pairing with is on site, mm -hmm. just because there are questions that need to be asked. Um, like for example, in, in the office, we usually have a bell okay. that folks ring when they have a question that their parent might not know the answer to. So when you need somebody to ring a bell, you have to send out an email. Um, or if there's a question with regards to product, mm -hmm. um, you need to actually get a hold of someone, you actually have to send out an email and wait in Google Hangouts for okay. someone to show up. Okay. Um, so, so the scheduling thing we talked about earlier. Um, you can't schedule questions. That's like true. That. That's true. You know, um, they you know they come up whenever. Do you ever just pick up the phone and call the person that you need to get the question well, answered from? Well, a lot of times when I've had to remote pair has been unscheduled. I see. Because um, you know I'm, I'm a father, okay. and there are times when I have to work from home. And I really don't need to call anybody. Okay. And chances are, whoever I'm pairing with is in the office. Yeah. Okay. But there are times when you know I'm pairing with somebody, and like they need to run to the bathroom, or they need to go and play ping pong, or they might be pulled into a meeting or for whatever reason, and I'm left to continue working. Okay. And then I, you know, come across something that I don't have the answer for, and I need to talk to someone. And, and by the way, if anyone wants a, a little bit deeper, more extensive follow-up, Joe Moore's presentation on this topic is a little more extensive and in-depth. It's like an hour and a half or something. Um, and he talks about how, you know, at uh, Pivotal, you know, sometimes they'll pick up the laptop and carry him around the office virtually yes. to interact with people. And so they sort of, they're very uh, oriented towards enabling that, like as if it were just, you know, uh, some sort of physical disability. Or something. Yeah. Lance, yes. so it's like, you, you know, you're covering kind of two things with this, too, because you've got, obviously, technology around, around, remote, yeah, around remote pairing, mm -hmm. but at the same time, too, obviously, there's the entire practice of pair programming, which yes. for a lot of developers, I mean, let's face it, a lot of us don't do that, even us that have experience with it and stuff like that, too. And, I mean, it's, I think that probably the biggest takeaway I have, because I've worked on projects before where we were 100% pairing, and at the end of the day, you're whipped, yeah. first of all. And the second thing is, is it's very difficult. I mean, the one thing that you guys have, which is really cool, is that because it's just primarily you two, you know each other. And that's one of the key yeah. things where when you have a bigger team, it's like making sure that everybody has good pairing skills and all that because certain dev pairs may not match up well. Right. And 
And, and because of the size of our company, we're both very motivated for like succeeding in projects, so we keep on getting paid. Well, yeah. So you know, this like, so into, uh, you know, into that. Um, anything else, Lance, on that? No, no, that, that was a big thing. Okay. Yes, sir. I was going to say something. He said something that that I found to be you know, when pairing with people is sometimes you have to let people make mistakes. Mm -hmm. And to me, part of a good pair is that trust where people have, you know, know that they have the freedom to fail. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Um, because it's been in some of those situations where the most creative solutions have come out of, you see somebody about to walk over the cliff and you go, oh, I'm going to let them keep going. Mm -hmm. And then something magically happens and they come flying back over, you know. Um, but that freedom to fail, that trust in your partner, I think is crucial. I like your dramatic visual, too. I, I do, too. <laughs> the, another thing that um, I like about what you bring up is I don't want the practice of pair programming to be an excuse to be cookie cutter. Like, oh, we're going to agree upon the safe solution instead of trying this thing that may not work but let's see if it actually does. And um, yeah, pairing um, is actually the best place to do just freeform experimentation because you get uh, you combine two perspectives on it, and you're able to do things in sort of more flexible ways. You discover more, you experiment more wildly, um, and so yeah, we'll both take turns going off on wild tangents, trying to troubleshoot an issue or build a feature, and um, usually, even if we completely fail at the end of the day and have to start over the next day. We've usually learned a lot in the process, like more so than we would have learned by like just looking up documentation and trying to figure it out on our own. Yes, so. yes sir. So I'm wondering what you all do when you come across a problem that, say, neither of you have a great grasp on. You solve, you solve it one way or the other. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, so you so just like put on your awesome. You just research on it. Okay. Occasionally, we'll just divide up time and, and you know say, all right, you know, if you need to go work on this emergency thing that came up, and I'll do the research and read the, the docs and try to figure it out before you get back, or you know, I mean, we're very, very overly flexible about this. We're probably not uh, performing pair programming as as disciplined as we probably should. But um, uh, yeah, I mean, usually we'll we'll just be flexible to break apart like that, or um, we'll you know split off on our respective browsers and read separate things at the same time, that kind of thing. Right, and yeah, that's split up. We're not strictly pair programming all the time. I think that's the takeaway. It's a very important part of what we do. There are other companies that do do it strictly, um, and I think some of that is a luxury of scale. Mm -hmm. So, for example, at our size, I mean, he might be working on a client project, and I really need to get a blog post out because, like, our blog having relevant content is part of our lead pipeline. So like you can't be necessarily um, as super strict as if you have a larger company with more people taking care of those different we, roles. We, we use pair programming to the degree and not past the degree that it is useful to us. So, yes? I think you started to address this, but are there any activities that you say it's definitely not useful or even detrimental? It sounds like research and um, what about um, there, both ways. I don't we've done it. But we we go back and forth. Sometimes it depends on who has the most uh, domain expertise or whatever. Again, like I said, if if he's got a, a SQL problem and you know I have no idea what's going on, uh, you know, behind the scenes, sometimes I'll just go work on make progress on some other project while he's dealing with that, and you know. Eight, five hours later, he's fixed it, and I'm, yeah. I have made some progress and not wasted time. So I, another thing, being working in a consulting company, what we'll try to do is if something is going to be a little bit of a boondoggle, like a client has a budget for a project, and something's wrong, and it's going to take us five, six hours to figure out. There's no way we can build them five hours. They don't have the money if we did, right? So what we'll do then is one of us will work on it because it has to get done. And the other will work on another project that has, um, taught, you know, yeah, billable value. Billable value. So as a company, we're able to get our stuff done and keep moving forward on all of it. We do a lot of creative billing strategies. <laughs> we can talk about that, but uh, another that's another talk. Um, on the on the topic, of both, we 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 pair it um, at, at where I work, and, and I really find that. Bug hunting and bug killing works better with two. Okay. Yeah. Like significantly because you know a lot of times you, you you start running out of patience. You start saying to yourself like I'm just not going to read this error message again. I've read it. I've read it. I've read it. 
and he's been playing every Stack Overflow article. But your pair <laughs> is looking at the other half. He says, like, stop, stop. I need to read this line. That's it. That's it right there. That's our thing. And it saves you like three hours of frustrated going down some other rabbit hole and going, I'm not going to go back and read that page again. Yeah, yeah it's really good. Thing. And so just having those, um, especially when you have no idea what that landscape looks like, having more eyes on it. Yeah, actually, the, the uh, I'm I'm relatively new to uh, programming in general. Um, I basically just started full time when I started working with Frank a year ago, and yeah, I found that there are def there have definitely been occasions where Frank is banging his head against the wall, screaming at the computer with some issue, and I'm I'm looking and I say, oh, is that not a syntax error right there? And you know, it's just something he was overlooking, or you know, it's the beginner's mind where I'm still trying to figure out basic stuff, and sometimes that's what he's forgetting about. Well, and vice versa, you know, he's he's got a lot more domain expertise uh, across most areas, and uh, you know, usually I'll be you know struggling with with solving some problem, and he can come in and pop in and look and say, oh yeah, just do it this way, because he knows, you know. So, um, like there've been times when we, you know, me and my parent and I will come across an issue that we both can't solve, mm -hmm. and the luxury of having a big team is that we can call on different people to come and just take a look. Sure. And that usually solves it. That's that is a nice benefit of that situation. <laughs> I think another benefit too is that especially if you have a senior or junior mm -hmm. pair, it brings the junior up to the senior yeah. very quickly. Oh yeah. Yes, it does. Much more quickly than you can do it on your own. It, it amazes me how many times um, one of the things that it has also helped has been like, I said, I'm like, okay, we're gonna do this, this, this. He's like, stop. I didn't understand a word of that. And like, that's a very humbling experience because I'm not trying to be opaque, um, but it's just, I need to be more precise. It, it goes back to, you know, optimizing for communication where like programming itself is an act of communication. So like improving it in any dimension is necessary to, to be better coders. And so, yeah, it sort of reinforces that in all directions. Also, fix the right personality zone to have the junior and the senior guy paired together. Because if you've got a real alpha programmer that wants to knock stuff out, you can end up with the anti pattern that they call go make a cup of tea. Mm -hmm. mm, yeah. Yeah, that's, it, that quickly idea. becomes not pairing at all. Right. <laughs> the same thing is true, though, too, because you also, if the junior, the junior developer has to have enough self confidence or be able to get out of their shell enough to not be like intimidated by the yeah. senior person. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And having seen that before, that's, it's a challenge with it. So it's yeah. really good you're able to do that again. Yeah, it's been, it's been yeah. for me, the, the largest jump in, you know, personal growth of my entire life this yeah. is this past year, yeah. just like having to dig in and, you know, if I don't know what's going on, I have to ask or have to go figure it out myself or get determined and, you know, drill into it with Frank, you know, so. I work um, with a, a Russian guy, he's a, he's a refugee or whatever, and he's just very militant and kind of like, you're talking about the alpha program. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but if you're new to the company, you're like, God, this guy's a freaking asshole. Like, it's just, he just has a way of talking, his delivery is just very, like, there's a huge social component that's like hard to even discuss as nerds, but like um, it's it's you know even it's even more important than you know the technical aspects. Anything else? I think we're you know past time now. So yeah, we're pretty close. Any last questions? Cool. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Guys.